morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where I am excited to wish you a happy Star Wars Day. Yes, the movie opens tonight here in the United States. It's already playing in many countries overseas. And as a result, Star Wars The Force Awakens is trending at the top of Twitter this morning because everybody's so excited. Some can say it rivals Christmas. Some can say it just extends Christmas to like a, a week long or two week long holiday. Uh, but everyone's definitely having a party. Uh, and before we get to today's stories, I just want to remind you of some Star Wars, uh, Star Warsy things. Uh, first off, when you go to see the movie, if you want to be included on the epic montage on Movie Math uh, on Monday, be sure to tweet me at Grace Randolph a picture of you uh, and whoever else you want to include in the photo. Uh, you know, be it the people you're going with, other patrons in the movie theater, the poster. Uh, some of you are uh, tweeting me pictures of you in costume. Uh, I'm getting great pictures so far, so thank you everyone who's already uh, tweeted me. But you want to tweet me a picture of you holding your ticket stub. Um, or if you, some people are tweeting me saying, but my ticket's in my phone because they're actually moving away from paper tickets, uh, at least here in the United States. So if that's the case, uh, hold up your phone, get someone else to take the photo, or I will accept just you at the theater, uh, you know, in front of something Star Warsy or in costume, all right? So just as long as you're at the theater and, you know, clearly you're going to see the movie. And you will see yourself included on uh, Movie Math on Monday uh, if I, uh, I like your tweet, because that means I've seen it and I've grabbed the photo. Uh, also, now that you're seeing Star Wars, you can finally vote in Beyond the Trailer's annual poll for uh, your top 10 movies of 2015. This is the audience vote. You have till January 2nd to vote, uh, but a lot of people have been waiting to vote until they've seen Star Wars. So now that that's happening, I've put a link in the video description down below. I'll be I'll be reminding you and tweeting it out, uh, but again, you have till January 2nd to fill that form out, uh, and the results will go up the following week. All right, so let's get started. Uh, I was uh, I saw Star Wars The Force Awakens on Tuesday night at the press screening. I stayed up all night covering it. So yesterday, while I was sleeping, uh, Warner Brothers released some cool new posters for uh, Batman uh, v Superman Dawn of Justice. And of course, the Wonder Woman one made the rounds the most because it was the coolest, but I want to talk about all of them. I thought that would be fun to do. So we're actually going to start out with the one that I thought was the worst. We're going to do them in the order that I like them. Uh, reverse. So this was the one I liked the least. Uh, and I'm surprised, actually, that it was um, it was approved by the producers, uh, you know, and just basically everyone who's supposed to approve these posters. If you don't know that, uh, the marketing team or whoever they outsource it to, an outside, outside marketing team, will make up, uh, you know, mock posters. And they'll send them out to the producers. Uh, you know, for instance, when I interned, I used to see all the, uh, these like uh, poster uh, presentations always like in the uh, in the store storage room with the scripts and everything. And so that's how one of the ways I, I got to see this. But they will do mock ups and they will show it to the produ like the producer was one of the people who needs to um, uh, to over to to give their approval. And, you know, so I'm surprised this went on someone's desk and they were like, yes. <laughs> so what's my problem with it? Well, I have to say, I think that Superman looks like he has a lot of makeup on. I mean, he looks more like he's like, like in the cabaret version of uh, Batman v Superman. Like Alan Cumming's gonna like, uh, you know, poke around. That's very, Alan Cumming would make a great Joker, by the way, especially his uh, cabaret, uh, you know, MC. He did such a good job and that's such an iconic performance for him at this point. But it's just a little bit, you know, I think like the darker lips, the very strong shadowing and contouring on the face, then the hair that seems almost wet with product. Uh, it's, well, you know, I, I think I'm very curious to see what Zack Snyder does with Superman. I think that he's making him, you know, you can see he looks pretty angry in this photo or this poster, but they're, you're creating, I think, a more angry, a maybe a somewhat more sexualized Superman. And I'm curious to see how that, how that comes across. Uh, Henry Cavill, as I said in my review, uh, gave off some very strong uh, sexual vibes in The Man From U.N.C.L.E. So I'm curious to see uh, how, if he can control his powers in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. But I think this is the uh, the weakest poster and very un-Superman-y. But maybe it's the new Superman and we should get used to it. All right, so the second uh, poster, I actually like this one a lot. Uh, I think it's adorable. This looks like, uh, oh, by the way, I wanted to point out, these remind me a lot of the character posters for Avengers Age of Ultron, you know, single character posters amidst debris, you know, uh, like a lot of stuff happening behind them. I just feel it's very similar. Now, of course, there's only so many ways you can put a comic book character on a poster, but I feel at some point, Warner Brothers is going to have to, you know, I know it's scary, Warner Brothers, but you're going to have to step out on your own and, you know, forge your own path in how you market your movies and not, not copy uh, Marvel quite so much. 
Marvel's like their training wheels. But eventually, you gotta learn to ride that bike all by yourself, Warner Brothers. But I like this poster because it looks like a toy. It looks almost like they took a photo of a toy instead of Ben Affleck in his bat armor. So I think that's really funny. I think they're really playing the bat armor, obviously, because that's the only way that Batman could realistically take on Superman for any extended period of time. Uh, but he, that's why I like it, because it looks so much like a toy. It reminds me of, besides an Avengers poster, it reminds me of uh, that kind of like um, way they've been filming things. It's like a craze right now. The opening credits for the Late Show with Stephen Colbert are actually done this way, where they do some kind of shift or filter, so it makes everything look like it's a model, like a model city, like it's not real. It's really cool. And this also kind of reminds me of that. So I like it a lot. I also like the way they incorporated each character's logo onto the poster. You know, it took me a, a little bit actually even to realize that because it's done so subtly. So I think that's excellent. But then, of course, the most amazing poster of them all, Gal Gadot uh, as Wonder Woman. She looks fantastic. I think that we have, the ship has sailed as um, to whether or not she's going to be a bulked up Wonder Woman. It's not going to happen. You can see. She's not doing it. You're just going to have to chalk it up to her Amazonian uh, blood, you know, her, her origin, the power of the Amazons in Themyscira, which they're actually kind of redoing actually a little bit in this ongoing Wonder Woman comic. I'm waiting for it to end before I cover it, but they're making a lot of changes to Wonder Woman mythology. Again! Uh, they're like, don't worry, nobody really knows what it is, so we can change it as many times as we want. We want to get it just right before people actually kind of know what's going on. But I think it's okay. I don't think she, I think there's different ways to go with Wonder Woman. You could go with her being muscular, like a Gina Carano, Ronda Rousey type character. And I know a lot of people wanted to see that. But you're not going to see it, obviously. And I think that sometimes, you know, different artists draw the character different ways. And I think it's very important for people to look at Wonder Woman uh, and want to be Wonder Woman. And I think, uh, you know, having her be like a bodybuilder type person, I think... Uh, while there are certain people who would love that, I think that would limit her appeal somewhat. So I can understand going in this direction. I think that Gal Gadot has a str strikes a very powerful stance here. I guess basically, I, you know, I'm really worried about this going the Malin Ackerman direction. With all due respect to Malin Ackerman, she seems like a very nice person, but, you know, she was someone that Zack Snyder cast to play Silk Spectre in Watchmen. You know, really I feel like uh, Zack Snyder casts who will look best in the costume rather than you know, or sexiest in the costume rather than who will do an amazing job with the character. Like, look what's happening with Daisy Ridley over in Star Wars The Force Awakens. No matter how anyone feels about that movie, uh, I think that everyone can agree that she knocks it out, knocks it out of the park as, uh, as Rey. She's just absolutely amazing. And so she, that's a good example of someone who's really likable to both men and women. That's hard to do, by the way. So that's what Gal Gadot needs to do. And so I just don't want her to be, I want her to have be a real, fully realized Wonder Woman, not just look at that sexy character standing next to Batman and Superman. You know, she needs to be able to carry her own movie. And I told you, as I said when Gal Gadot was cast, I really liked her in the Fast and Furious movies. It's rare for a model to be a good actress and a likable actress to boot. Uh, Charlize Theron is someone who's managed to pull that off. Uh, but I think Gal Gadot, based on what I've seen so far, which warranted isn't much, I think she can do it. But to me, I think the most important thing about this poster is that it looks like Wonder Woman. It really does, and she looks cool, she looks powerful, she looks, and also, she's not voguing. And I think that's also really important. I think that a lot of actresses fall into the voguing trap. It's bad. It's, it's a trap for a reason. Uh, and I think that Gal Gadot so far is not doing that. She's doing it a little bit in the first image they released for the Wonder Woman solo movie, which is why I really hate that image and I'm worried about what Patty Jenkins is doing to the character. <laughs> She's like, I'm like, Patty Jenkins, please don't undo everything Zack Snyder is doing because he seems so far, so far, to be doing it right. But it's a great poster. I really like it. It looks like... A, if, if this was the cover of a comic book, I would believe it, and that's what I like to see in my comic book movies. So I am absolutely thrilled, and I know a lot of people were when this was released yesterday. All right, so speaking of Marvel, let's move on to the second story of the day, which has to do with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, which is just beginning to cast, uh, at least the major roles. That's what they usually do. You know, a script is done, then they decide to cast like the big new characters because they want to make the headlines and the trades, and then they move forward with pre-production, you know, because it's still, you know, they're still um, not really officially making the movie as of yet. They want to get these big names, and so when they feel they have a very good main cast assembled, they'll start looking for uh, locations, and they'll start casting, you know, the rest of the movie, etc. Uh, you know, getting it all, getting the machine moving, right? Uh, so they actually tried to cast uh, a major new role in Guardians of the Galaxy like a month or so ago when they offered the role to Matthew McConaughey. At least that's the rumor. Uh, and Matthew McConaughey said no. And that's never really uh, a good headline for your movie. It's the opposite, I'm sure, of what uh, Marvel 
Marvel was hoping to be able to post in the trades. Because, you know, the first Guardians of the Galaxy was such a huge success, you know, why would someone say no to it? I think it hurts it just a tad, uh, you know, just like I think Doctor Strange is going to suffer from that a little bit, you know, that they offered it to so many people and so many people turned it down. That You know, people weren't like in line to be Doctor Strange. They were like, maybe I will, maybe I won't, I won't. And you're like, what? But I think that, you know, things might work out for Guardians of the Galaxy. It's, it's tricky, and we'll talk, we'll talk about why in just a moment. But I do think this is a case where if all this comes to pass, the right actors ended up in the right movies. Uh, I think that Matthew McConaughey belongs in Dark Tower as an evil wizard cowboy opposite Idris Elba, hopefully. And I think that Kurt Russell, who is now James Gunn's first choice, uh, first choice to play uh, Peter Quill's father, uh, and we'll see what kind of changes they make to the character from the comics. You know, he's the, uh, the the ruler of Spartax in the comics, but they've said that they've changed a lot and they're not going to totally go by canon. So we'll see what happens. But I think that Kurt Russell is an excellent, excellent match uh, with what James Gunn has created over in Guardians of the Galaxy. I also think he's a great match with Chris Pratt because both have a lot of heart. You know, like they have edge, they can be tough guys, you know. Of course, Kurt Russell is Snake Pilsen, so isn't Snake Pilsen, especially considering the 80s, uh, strong 80s vibe that the Guardians of the Galaxy has, uh, you know, 70s, 80s, I think. Uh, I think it's awesome that you would get such an iconic character from that era to be his father. I think that's really great. So you have like a good uh, vibe from both people personally, and then you have this great history for Kurt Russell. And Kurt Russell's doing really re well right now. He's in the Fast and Furious movies, kind of as like their Nick Fury now. And also he's in Tarantino's Hateful Eight. We'll be talking about Tarantino momentarily, uh, and the Hateful Eight, actually. Uh, but anyway, the only concern that I have about ca casting Kurt Russell is that I think that Guardians of the Galaxy walks a really fine line and that it's kind of like this cult hit kind of it has this cult hit kind of vibe to it uh, that James Gunn specializes in and what made the first Guardians of the Galaxy so quirky. Uh, but, you know, that's a kind of movie that not a lot of people usually go and see. And so Guardians of the Galaxy was an anomaly that you took this movie that usually would be considered like a B movie, maybe, you know, and you were able to make it an A-plus movie. And that's unusual. So how do you go forward and continue to have that vibe uh, and but still continue to bring in that box office. I think Chris Pratt is part of that answer because clearly, you know, he's two for two with Guardians of the Galaxy and then Jurassic World. But <clears throat> I think Kurt Russell, of course, usually doesn't do very well at the box office. He is someone the audiences are, you know, know very well and have, you know, kind of passed on it in large part. I mean, he's in the Fast and Furious movies and that, he did, they certainly didn't hurt that, uh, but I think none of, no one in the Fast and Furious movies is able to do well outside of them, right? So the Fast and Furious movies have their own magic and maybe so does Guardians of the Galaxy. But, you know, you don't want to tip your hand too much. To, to, how do you balance it? How do you not go too far or so far into B-movie territory that you become you know, an official B-movie. So I'm curious, what do you think of Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? Do you think Snake Pilsen is a perfect choice? Or do you think he's a great choice creatively? But like me, you have a little bit of a concern from a business perspective. Now, speaking of business, let's move on to the third story of the day where Tarantino is mighty upset with the Walt Disney Company. So what's going on? Well, he went on Howard Stern. And Disney hasn't commented on this, so we don't know if it's true or not, but it's been reported uh, by all the trades. Everyone's talking about it. And, you know, Tarantino, uh, he did accuse Bruce Dern's agents of leaking the, uh, the script for The Hateful Eight, so he, he certainly is not one to shy away from speaking his mind. Uh, but, you know, who knows how much he embellishes these stories. But I think, it, you know, he's been caught of lying about whether or not he spent time in jail when he was starting out with his career, as he's, you know, liked to say so often. Uh, but I'm inclined to believe this is somewhat true. But so what, let's talk about what's going on. But I think it speak to a, speaks to a larger problem that Tarantino has brought to everyone's attention. So The Hateful Eight, obviously, as everybody knows, opens in limited release on Christmas Day and then will go wide in time for New Year's. Uh, and it has solid buzz. Uh, the embargo lifts on Monday, so I'm able to review it at that point. That's why you haven't gotten my review yet, even though I've seen the film. And I think overall, I can tell you, I enjoyed it. So he wanted it to play on the Cinerama Dome at the Arclight Cinemas in Hollywood uh, because that's a classic theater. You know, he grew up, he, you know, well, he, he career-wise grew up in Los Angeles. He has very strong feelings about that. And when you see the movie, it has the Cinerama Dome logo at the beginning of the film. You know, it's made it filmed in 70 millimeter. It wants to, he, Tarantino wants it shown in 70 millimeter. 
And the problem he's running into is that all those big screen theaters are being currently used for Star Wars The Force Awakens, uh, which is something in the heart of the sea had a problem with. And The Revenant is also having a problem that it can't go on any IMAX screens or screens like the Cinerama Dome. But Tarantino really wanted the Cinerama Dome because, again, he has a personal attachment to that. He put the logo on his movie. He wanted that one theater. But he told uh, Howard Stern that Disney... Uh, you know, the, uh, from an exhibitor stand, uh, I mean, from a distributor standpoint, this is okay. Distributors are the studios who release the films and you know put it into theaters. And exhibitors is what you call a movie theater company. They're the ones who exhibit the film, right? So the studio distributes it to the movie theater, which exhibits it to the uh, exhibits it to the audience. So the studio called the distributor called the exhibitor, and they said, "We really want Star Wars: The Force Awakens on the." Um, the, Cin the Cinerama Dome because it's such a famous theater and we want Star Wars to be on all the major screens because it's such a big deal movie. So uh, Arclight tried to say, well, we have a contract with Tarantino and Weinstein Company so we can show it there until Christmas Day when Hateful Eight opens. But apparently, according to Tarantino, Disney said, if you don't play it on the Cinerama Dome for the extent of its run, uh, we're going, or for you know at least a certain amount of weeks, we're not going to let Star Wars The Force Awakens play at any Arclight theater in all of Los Angeles, which is primarily where that, that chain is based. So they blinked. And, you know, uh, you, some people will probably say, well, you know, since there was a contract with the Weinstein Company between Arclight and the Weinstein Company, why don't they sue for breach of contract, right? People don't really sue in Hollywood because, you know, you know talk about ruining your career if you if you're litigious i mean being litigious in hollywood is like a last resort like your career is over you're already drummed out of hollywood you've got nothing to lose it's one of the reasons you've, you've seen that people like it took so long for interns to organize and say if you don't pay us we're going to sue you right so it, that's kind of like the the way hollywood works and so that's why you don't really see a lot of lawsuits in hollywood which is you know interesting in and to of itself but anyway so tarantino the most he can really do apparently is go on howard stern and complain and kind of like create some negative publicity for Star Wars and the Disney company. So how do I feel about this? And I'm curious to hear your thoughts down below. I think it's one screen. And there are lots of IMAX screens all over Los Angeles. It's not like Star Wars The Force Awakens doesn't have places to screen. And I would also say that it would play on the Cinerama Dome between December 18th and December 25th. So it would have those days for people in Los Angeles who are also love the Cinerama Dome, but I would suspect if anyone loves the Cinerama Dome that much, they probably want to see the Hateful Eight on that as well. I think to have the logo in the movie, and I hope I would think that Tarantino would remove that logo at this point because I'd be like, I'm not going to provide it, uh, advertising for that. Uh, but I would have let Tarantino have it, especially because the movie's only opening on a handful of screens. So, and also, you know, you know they've, he's already gotten totally uh, screwed over in terms of the IMAX situation. So let him have the one Cinerama Dome. But the reason this is interesting is a larger story is that it's talking, it's bringing to everyone's attention just how crowded the Christmas release date is. You not only have Star Wars coming in here and taking up multiple screens for multiple showings, like more than the usual two. I, I bet like four or five screens. Uh, it would be very interesting to see how the box office shakes out for this film. But then you have not only like Joy coming out, you know, a bunch of wide releases, Joy, Concussion, Daddy's Home, uh, but you also have Sisters and Alvin and the Chipmunks opening this weekend as well. Uh, and then you have these limited releases like The Revenant and The Hateful Eight. So there just aren't enough movie theaters. So exhibitors are saying that they are getting calls from the distributors, the studios, and they are screaming at them because of course the studio is only worried about their movie. They want to make sure it's on a big screen. They want to make sure it has enough screens because it's like a domino effect. If it doesn't have enough screens, screens or isn't in good on good screens right like you need a big screen for the revenant right but then it's embarrassing for daddy's home to be playing in the smallest theater in the house so that's going to affect the box office so there's tremendous pressure all the way down the line right there's tremendous pressure for the movie to perform from the suits so they're exerting that pressure on the publicity department and the publicity department is therefore exhibiting um, pressure on the distribution department because they're like if you don't get me in the right theaters and enough theaters what am I going to do so then the, dis the distri distribution distribution department then calls up the exhibitors, you know, now we've jumped to a different company, we're outside of the company at this point, and they're yelling at them because they don't want to get in trouble with their boss. So you just have a powder keg uh, situation here, and I think the short of it is, is that people shouldn't have given Star Wars such a wide berth in the two weeks leading up to it. They should have used those dates, they should have used uh, October and September a little bit better, but Star Wars created a huge problem that everybody wanted to not be in the movie's way, they all waited for after, it's just like we're seeing
see all these trailers drop at once and you'll notice that there's trailer fatigue harry potter and fantastic beasts which we're going to talk about in just a minute or fantastic beasts and where to find them the harry potter prequel didn't perform very well as a trailer because i think people were so they're distracted by other trailers it just was a really unfortunate situation and i hope that hollywood has learned from this and won't do this again i mean i think that Star Wars, of course, is a unique situation, but it's just really, I think, hurt a lot of movies. Uh, you know, and it's supposed to buoy them. It's supposed to bring everything up, and we'll see if maybe it does. We'll see what the, what the not only the t the box offices over the opening weekend for Star Wars, but how it plays throughout the rest of the holiday season. Maybe people just all go see Star Wars, and that's it. And if people don't have a good Star Wars experience, maybe they'll decide not to go to the movies anymore for the rest of the season. It's very tricky. All right, so let's get on to that viewer question from David McNulty. And David says, Hi, Grace. Uh, Dave from the UK here. Love the show. Watch it daily after work. Oh, excellent. I hope you had a great day at work. Uh, it might already be after your work day since you're in the UK, five hours ahead. Uh, I have my first ever question for you, if you don't mind. Of course I don't mind. In your review, you stated that the Harry Potter films cast very prestigious British actors, and yet with the U.S. cast, they have not gone down this route. While I agree, I feel that many of the actors, well, actually, David wrote, whilst I agree, which is very UK, very British of you, I love it. Uh, or whilst, I was like, I can't pronounce that word correctly, but I, I didn't want to, I, didn't, I wanted to give you the credit, David, for using it. So David says, I feel that many of the actors cast in the Harry Potter films were character actors known for playing different and unusual roles. Take Helena Bonham Carter, for instance. Do you think the casting directors have potentially tried to go down this route when casting Fantastic Beasts, opting for people who would fit into the rather eccentric wizarding world rather than trying to get big Hollywood names? Also, if you were to cast a, a prestigious U.S. actor or actress for this kind of property, who would be your ideal choice? Thanks a bunch, and have a lovely day. Smiley face. Ah, what a great question, David. I think it's true. And, you know, when I first read your question, I was like, hmm, that is difficult. I'm having trouble off the top of my head thinking of prestigious character actors in the United States. And I say character actors because that's largely who they went with for, um, as, as uh, David said, in, in, the, in the U.K., and that's the casting director's job. The casting director is supposed to say, just like we just did, hmm, I need character actors. And so I was like, well, how would I go about that? And it occurred to me, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Best Supporting Actor category and see who was nominated. And I came up with a really good list really quickly. So let me tell you who I think are good U.S. actors, both male and female, for that they could have used for Fantastic Beasts. Uh, Brian Cranston, J.K. Simmons, uh, Robert Duvall, uh, Stanley Tucci, uh, Jeremy Renner. Actually, Brian Cranston uh, will maybe be nominated for an Oscar this year for Trumbo, uh, but I picked him because he was the first person I thought of as like, he was like my... Um, Alan Rickman, U.S. version of Alan Rickman. So that's why I picked Brian Cranston. Then in the uh, female category, you have Laura Dern, Emma Stone, Amy Adams, Maggie Gyllenhaal, and also Anna Kendrick. I think those last three, Amy Adams, well, Amy Adams is already Lois Lane, so she's very busy, but Maggie Gyllenhaal and Anna Kendrick could have made a great uh, Porpentina, the role of what, to Catherine Waterston, who's not all well known at all. So, so we'll see what happens. But I think all those actors would have been great. And I think a good example of a cast that has a lot of great U.S. character actors, or you know, a great just I don't know if they're all they're obviously not all character actors, obvious actually. But uh, I think it was like kind of the cast you would expect for Fantastic Beasts, and that's Hail Caesar from the Coen Brothers. That has a wonderful all-star cast. Uh, some U.K. actors in there as well, according uh, as well, um, including Rafe Fiennes. Uh, but I. I think that that would be a good cast. Uh, so I also wonder if maybe because uh, Fantastic Beasts doesn't have the cachet of the Harry Potter novels, that maybe they had trouble getting U.S. actors. Maybe U.S. actors, and also because it's not this isn't the U.K. Maybe there isn't the same reverence for the source material, uh, and so maybe it was harder to sign people. I don't know. And I do have to say that I just was talking about this trailer failing to connect, and I do wonder if that's partially because they don't have a great cast. Uh, maybe, you know, that's the trick with adult actors, right? And not having a, a book that's a huge runaway success. I mean, it's a spinoff and people have bought the Fantastic Beasts textbook, uh, but it's not a Harry Potter book. Uh, so maybe that combination of not being an actual legitimate Harry Potter book, uh, you know, it's a continuation of the story and being so removed from the original story that everybody's come to know and love and not having cast members that anyone's exciting about, excited about, maybe that's creating a bit of the problem for Fantastic Beasts. But I think it looks amazing. All right, so so anyway, that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to write down below what you think of today's top three stories and that viewer question, who would you like to see in Fantastic Beasts and why do you think it's not connecting with audiences so far? Uh, and then, of course, don't forget to vote in that Beyond the Trailer top ten poll. All right, have fun at Star Wars.